Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog. And yes, I'm going to try to squeeze this in before I go to work today. Uh, so I have a review here, a discussion, I should say, of Beyond, which is this uh, you know miniseries that came out, um, I think in like 2008 or nine, somewhere around there maybe. Um, it's written by the late great Dwayne McDuffie, who was a phenomenal writer, did a lot of stuff in the early 90s and uh, throughout and since then, um, did stuff for uh, Milestone, you know, at DC, you know, eventually work in DC, did stuff on Justice League, Justice League Unlimited cartoon, like, the guy was very talented, I had a pleasure meeting him a few times when I lived in California, always a nice guy, just super awesome, sad to hear about his passing when it happened uh, years back, and, uh, and so when I was going through looking for Venom stuff that I haven't covered, I was, I came across this and I go, you know, I had this when it came out because I have somewhere in my collection, not here, but maybe like in storage somewhere or something. I have a number one of this signed by Dwayne. I know I do because I remember talking to him at Golden Apple and being like, oh, my God, you know, like it, you're Dwayne McDuffie. And he's like, yeah, nice to meet you, young man. You know, he was a super cool guy. And uh, and so I remember having that. So I know I read this series before, but it, it kind of left my mind. I was like, I remember Spider-Man dies in it, but it's not really Spider-Man. And that was pretty much all I could remember about the book. So when I went back and reread it, it was kind of neat because there's a character in here and someone can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think Dwayne created him, but maybe he did. There's a character named Gravity that popped up in Marvel like a year and a half or two years before this book came out. So the character was kind of new. And like I said, I don't remember if Dwayne created him or someone else did, but he was a new character that came in. He was kind of like Spider-Man. Uh, he was... um just a regular kid uh, in New York and he had a best friend who was this girl that he kind of had a crush on but they were friends and so he was not really friend zoned I just don't think she knew he had interest in her romantically so around the time he reveals that he has uh, feelings for her romantically it kind of messed up their friendship a little bit which I guess you know a lot of people guys and girls could probably relate to that uh, but then he also revealed he was a superhero. He got superpowers called gravity. He has this blue and white suit and he, you know, can control gravity basically. Um, so that he can use that to make himself fly. He can, you know, add density to his punches and stuff like that. So it, it's pretty neat. He's actually a pretty cool character. So then she, you know, was like, oh, you know, like not because he's a superhero, but it made her see a different side of him. She thought he was kind of a sheepish kind of, you know, uh, uh, introvert kind of guy. But then when he, you know, she sees his real personality, he's kind of outgoing and he's kind of funny um, and charming. She's like, oh, okay. And so she kind of falls in love with him. So this book picks up with them kind of at that point of the relationship, but it was like they, they patched up from the rocky patch they had and are now uh, elevated their friendship into a relationship. And so he really cares about her and he wants to get back to um, Earth because in this story after he fights a villain, he gets teleported through this teleport machine that just appears out of nowhere in the middle of New York. He gets teleported to um, another planet, which turns out to be Battle World from the Secret Wars storyline. So this is kind of Dwayne McDuffie McDuff returning to that kind of sense of storytelling, like, hey, let's go back to the 80s. Let's kind of do something fun. Let's grab a random group of characters. And I'm kind of curious. I'd love to you know, know the behind the scenes story of this, of whether he chose these characters, all of them, or if Marvel you know, it was like, hey, maybe switch this character for that one. Like, I'd love to kind of learn how that worked because whether he did it himself or it was done by committee, I think they picked a really good group of characters to be in this book. I mean, it, it's it's pretty neat. They have uh, the Wasp is in here. Um, the Hood, who is a character that started to pop up more at this time in the comic books. Uh, he's like this young guy who, um, you know, wears like a red hood. You know, he's got two guns, almost like red hood, kind of. Uh, but he's like a young guy, but he has a girlfriend who's pregnant. And so he's got real world. He, it's He's almost like a, if a Peter Parker went down the wrong road, which is kind of like Jason Todd is like if Dick Grayson went down the wrong road. Well, whatever. So, but, I, you know, Hood is there. Um, Medusa, queen of the um, Inhumans which is awesome. And there's actually a great scene between her and Wasp where they're talking about their husbands. You know, like Wasp was like, well, my ex-husband, you know, Hank, uh, you know, Hank Pym, who's here on this adventure, you know, so you have uh, Dr. Pym right there, Hank, um, get Spider-Man there. And, uh, and so because Hank is there, uh, you know, there's a, a scene where Wasp pucks to Medusa and she's like, you know, my ex, he's here. He's always around. He's all, you know, like, I feel like he's always trying to prove that he's become a better man. He hit me one time many years ago. He's apologized a thousand times. I don't ever want to really forgive him for that. And then Medusa's like, nor should you. If a man struck me like that in, in that kind of circumstance, um, I probably wouldn't forgive him either. And she goes, uh, she goes, but um, if he is being a better person, I guess you have to acknowledge that too. You know, it doesn't mean you have to be friends with him or be close to him. You're right to keep your distance from him. Um, it doesn't mean he won't repeat the mistake. 
you know, but it's, if he hasn't done it since, and he is trying to be a better person, maybe that's some perspective to have too. So it was neat seeing that between these two women, uh, having that kind of conversation there. Um, and then she talks about, well, how, how have you stayed, you know, um, married to Black Bolt all these years? And she goes, ah, most of my adult life, like as soon as I was able to marry in our culture, and so was Black Bolt, we got married and we've been king and queen ever since. And, uh, and she goes, well, how do you keep the marriage going? She goes, and then Medusa even says, well, the fact that he can't talk actually helps our communication quite a bit. <laughs> so whenever we disagree on stuff, uh, she's like, I'm able to get the final word in. And I was like, oh, that's kind of neat. Like that's, that's neat, she acknowledged that. Um, so anyway, and then of course, Venom is in there, but it's Matt Gargan Venom. So we have Matt Gargan Venom there. Uh, and so, uh, and then we have a Firebird, um, Craven the Hunter, but at this point it's not actual Craven the Hunter. It's like one of his kids, I think, and he's like a good guy and he wants to be a movie star or something. It's He's kind of weird. I remember this take on him and I never really liked it, but he's kind of friendly with Spider-Man. Um, and then I think uh, Deathlock shows up at one point. So, uh, and then they get, so they get sent to this world. I am uh, from beyond. They believe it's the Beyonder. And they find out later it's not the Beyonder. And they also find out later that uh, Spider-Man isn't actually Spider-Man. And the way they find that out is because Venom actually kills Spider-Man with a scorpion tail strike right in the first issue, right at the end of it. He kills him. And so that turns all the heroes against uh, Venom, obviously. And like I said, Gravity's here as well. So that's pretty much the whole cast right there. You got Gravity, Firebird, um, Hank Pym, Wasp, Medusa, Craven, Hood, Venom, and Spider-Man. So those are all your main characters. And then, like I said, Deathlock shows up uh, in like the second or third issue. Um, and it's the Michael version of Deathlock, uh, which is cool. I think he's like the late 90s version of Deathlock. Um, so yeah, the, so the team turns against Venom. So Venom for a, for like a couple issues is just being beaten down by the team. Actually, uh, Medusa pins him down and gives him 50 lashes for killing Spider-Man. Because they're like, she's like, I want to kill him. And they're like, no, we don't kill. Let's bring him back to Earth. We'll figure out what's going on here. We'll get the Beyonder to send us back to Earth. And we'll we'll turn Venom over to the authorities. And Medusa's like, no. <laughs> so she like uses her hair to pin Venom down and lashes him like, you know, a dozen times before he breaks free and he gets away. So that's pretty much what Venom does in this one is he's he's kind of the enemy at first. And then, you know, because it's Matt Gargan, he's kind of a douche. And he uh, gets his lashes and then he overpowers Medusa and get, just enough to get away. And so he does go missing for a couple issues. And during those issues, you have the team fighting amongst themselves. You know, the Beyonder voice comes on, you know, and says, you need to kill each other one by one. And whoever's left alive at the end, I will grant you your, you know, ultimate wishes or whatever. And so they're like, uh, sure you will, whatever. You know, we don't believe that. It's more like a monkey's paw. Like we know about the old Beyonder and, and everything. So we're not doing this. So when they come across Deathlock, Deathlock is burying like a bunch, he's burying like a, a body and there's like 50 other bodies there. And he tells the heroes, I've been here for years. Like, cause he disappeared in the comics for a while. So this was Dwayne McDuffie's way of coming up with where he's been, which I thought was kind of clever. So he's been on this planet this whole time and he survived uh, uh, the first battle by making a deal with the Beyonder saying like, hey, if you send my friends back, uh, Captain Marvel, a couple of these other characters, if you send them back to Earth, uh, mind wipe their memories so they don't know I'm here, so they won't come back to try to save me. If you send everybody to Earth, um, I'll, I'll stay here for you and I'll just be a servant and I'll bury all the bodies. And, uh, and so that's what he does. And he's burying not just people from Earth, he's burying other, a couple other races too, mostly people from Earth though. But, he's, uh, but they are from different cultures. So he's like, I don't know if this is appropriate for your culture. He's like saying a little prayer before he buries them. And I don't know, there was neat character stuff in here. I thought that's what Dwayne was always really good at. And actually the art by Scott Collins, I'm not always a fan of his. I like some of his Flash stuff and things, but I'm not always a fan of his style. But I actually like this book overall. I was really surprised because I don't remember this being something that held my interest. Uh, but yet when I reread this, I read it cover to cover. I was like, wow, this really kept my, uh, you know, kept my attention because of the character moments. The story is a little goofy and it, it's a little drawn out. I feel like maybe it goes one or two issues a little too long. Um, but because you get some of those good character moments in there, I kind of forgave it because I knew it wasn't the Beyonder. I mean, it's pretty obvious. The, the Beyonder would have showed up right in issue one and stated the rules, you know, like before. In this one, it's not the, the Beyonder, and it's pretty clear it's not. So to drag that out for like six or seven issues felt a little silly to me. Um, but like I said, because he's these great character moments, 
it, it it didn't hurt as bad. It wasn't like doing homework. It was like, all right, well, there's enough good character stuff in here to make me anticipate when they finally do reveal that it's not the Beyonder. Um, but then what happens is Spider-Man's dead body gets back up and starts walking around and tries to get the characters to turn on each other and kill each other. And they're like, uh, Spider-Man doesn't want people to kill people so why are like so you're not spider-man so they figure that out and they uh capture him and they find out it's actually um the uh the the space phantom i think is his name and the space phantom is this being who can like inhabit other people's bodies so he can if he uh like uh, shape shifts into you wherever you are you go into limbo and you stay in limbo with no memory that you're there until you know the space phantom changes into somebody else then you get to go back and he gets to then then the next person goes in limbo so that's a pretty neat thing because i think that's a cool way to uh, handle memory gaps in the marvel universe if characters ever don't remember each other or something i'm like oh you can always kind of blame the space phantom which is kind of neat um so then yeah so space phantom becomes dragon man <laughs> one of the fantastic four characters and fights against deathlock and some of the other heroes and uh, and so he gets, keeps getting the upper hand keeps getting away from them but they finally do capture him uh, what they do is they find a way into limbo hank pym has shrunken a science lab and he expands it and then in there they're able to work on this device he was working on they complete it with the help of deathlock they open up a portal and they go in there and they wait in limbo for uh, the, uh, the the space phantom to show back up, um, and so when the space phantom shows up, he's able to um, you know they, like he has to go back to limbo to release that body and then take his next form. So when they realize that, they're like, okay, we can now you know take him down basically. So this is what the space phantom looks like. He transforms from his Spider-Man form into, uh, and it's funny because he kind of outs everybody as as that Spider-Man's Peter Parker. <laughs> so all these People know now that Peter Parker is, but not all of them, but I think a couple of them are within ear range of that. And I think it might have been characters that already knew, like Wasp and Hank Pym probably already knew. Um, but still, it was kind of funny. I was like, wow, they just openly said he's Peter Parker and this group of people. But uh, yeah, so the Space Phantom, he is now uh, apparently the threat. He said the Beyonder has brought him here and has pinned him here. And he is uh, he's just here to make sure the game progresses because sometimes people don't want to kill each other so with his abilities he's able to turn into somebody and get the ball rolling if he needs to so in this case he was spider-man uh, but he really picked the wrong ball to get rolling because no one's going to believe spider-man wants to kill people and they didn't so they attacked him so that's what outed him in the end so not a very smart character uh with with which is probably good with his abilities because if he was smart and had those abilities he could probably do a whole lot of damage so um but at this point i know this is a venom vlog venom has mostly not been in this uh, part of the book but he finally shows up when all the characters are in limbo and they're, they're waiting for the space phantom to show up to you know to grab his physical form um again venom destroys the space portal that they created from the outside so now that leaves venom the only one left on the planet so he says beyonder i did it the others are dead they're gone they're trapped in limbo and here i am giving my reward uh, i want my wishes i want to go back home and that's uh that's what he so venom thinks he wins so for a whole issue venom is on the outside screaming for the beyonder and all the other characters on the inside and that's when space phantom shows up as north star from alpha flight and stuff which is pretty cool um and he also later became an x-man and got married and stuff uh so north star shows up as you know space phantom is north star and starts talking to venom being like where's the other characters and uh, you know and he's like well you yeah, know they're dead they went through a portal and i don't know where that led them so i, I shut the portal so i'm the only one here and so, you know, Space Phantom's like, I gotta find out where they are. So let me go maybe turn into somebody else and use a different ability and maybe I can track them. So he goes back to the, uh, the limbo realm to, uh, to take over, you know, to release North Star and take over a new character's body. And that's when he sees the other heroes. And while he's there though, um, or before he gets there, uh, Hank actually kisses Firebrand. You actually find out that Firebrand has a crush on Hank and they kiss thus helping Hank move on from Janet. Cause that's the one thing that he kind of follows Janet or the wasp around like a little dog and tries to white knight her a lot. And she doesn't like it. And that's what leads her to go have that conversation with Medusa. And then they look over and they see Hank's like, you know what, uh, you know, Firebrand's like, why are you doing this? Like, you know, move on, you, you, you know, what's the point of trying to convince her you've changed? And he's like, well, maybe a part of me still loves her, but you're right, I should move on. And then he ends up kissing Firebrand. So it's him kind of growing a little bit as a character. And then also that being exactly what 
you know, Wasp wanted because she didn't want this like old ex-husband hanging around her all this time. So she's kind of like, yeah, good, go away. Uh, so yeah, Hank's, he's not written as the, he's definitely written as a flawed person. That's for sure. I mean, he is a, he's one of those characters that I think is very flawed. Like Eddie Brock, we talk about a lot, who struggles with doing the right thing, you know? And sometimes heroes do, like Tony Stark does sometimes too. But I think Hank Pym sometimes takes it to a, a whole new level, <laughs> as, as does Eddie Brock sometimes. Um, but so Matt Gargan shows back up. He's like, no, you can't be alive, you know, because the heroes, they grab, they latch onto a fit, a Space Phantom and they go back to the, you know, the Beyonder world, battle world with him. And then they see Venom and so they all start fighting. And that's when Watu shows up, Watu the Watcher. And I love this design of him. It's a little different, uh, but it's, it's got a lot more going on which I like. Actually, like if they did a Marvel Universe, you know, the movie version, I know they, we saw ty some types of Watchers um, in, in Guardians 2, I think it was, but like if they ever do Watu in a, in a full form, I hope they take a little bit from this design because I just like some of the details in there. Like this is just stuff that isn't really normally given to Watu as a character. He's just like plain robe, bald head, you know, kind of collar thing. But this was kind of neat to kind of, you know, see all this, like see this design to him. So he shows up and they're like, wait, if Watu's here, you know, that must mean something of big importance is going to happen. Something cosmic that is going to change the universe in some way, no matter how big or small, because that's usually when the Watcher shows up. So as that happens, Hank Pym turns on his team and kills them all and then says, all right, Beyonder, uh, you know, I'm here. I killed my team. Come give me my wishes. And so Watu is observing all this and you're like, wait, Hank, what the heck? Like, I know you're kind of broken and something's going on with you, but this seems like too much. Well, there is a scene earlier in the book where he did talk it out or he says, hey, I think I have a plan, Deathlock, or Michael, he calls him. He's like, I think I have a plan on how we can fool this Beyonder because I don't think it's really the Beyonder. And so they all in a group in limbo come up with the plan right before uh, Space Phantom showed up. So we never really saw that conversation, but I thought Dwayne did a really good job of setting it up and then making you forget about that conversation because then it comes back here at the end because the Beyonder or the Beyonder <laughs> shows up and says, you know, I'm here. What do you, what do you want? And he says, well, I want three wishes. And he's like, okay, fine. You get three wishes. What are they? And he says, um, I want to be returned to earth. And the Beyonder's like, yep. Okay. No problem. What else? And he goes, um, I want to know who you really are. And, uh, he goes, well, I can't tell you who I really am. And he goes, uh, yes, you can and you will uh, because uh, that's what I want. That's my wish. And I don't believe you're actually the Beyonder. So he's like, all right, fine. I'm not the Beyonder. I'm a stranger, a different race of beings, like kind of like Beyonders. And uh, he talks about how he saw the original Beyonder create Battle World, bring all the heroes there, and then it get destroyed. But he thought the Beyonder was on to something. He thinks one of the greatest threats in the universe is mankind because superheroes are coming out of mankind, mutants are coming out of mankind, with Terrigen Mists, Inhumans have come out of mankind, the Phoenix Force has chosen to reside on Earth in one of the X-Men, you know, Jean Grey, um, or Rachel Summers sometimes, you know, depending. Um, and so because of this, Earth is like this, you know, Galactus has failed to eat Earth numerous times, uh, the planet has failed to essentially die and be destroyed numerous times by many deities and, and, and gods and everything. So uh, so the stranger's like, I think there's something to your race. And, you know, we have a saying in space that uh, when everything else dies, the only thing left will be cockroaches and humans, <laughs> which I was like, well, that's great because that's what we say to ourselves. We say, oh, after nuclear bombs and everything goes off, everything dies, it's just going to be cockroaches left. Well, in this one, they say it's cockroaches and humans, according to the, the gods of the universe. So, so he thinks we're a threat. And so he's like, ah, oh, if I just bring you all to the planet and have you all kill each other one by one and reduce your numbers, you know, it might take some time, but I'll do it. I'll, you know, I'll just keep working at this because I'm infinite. Um, I can have you guys kill yourselves and let some of you weaker ones live. And then we can finally get rid of your stupid race. Um, and, uh, and he was like, so I, that's my whole plan is to do that. And then they, they were like, well, we're going to fight back. He's like, well, which odds do you have of beating me? I'm not going to, because they're like, well, you're, what do you want for your third wish? And like, we want you to leave and never do this again. He's like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to honor that wish. He's like, instead, I'm going to kill you. And they're like, well, you're obviously not because the Watcher's here, Watu. 
And then watcher, you know, the stranger looks over and goes, Watsu, he goes, what are you doing here? You're, you know, you're only supposed to be here for major events, no matter how big or small, but you're, you're only supposed to be here for things that will change fabric of the universe in, on some level. And, uh, and Watu just stays silent. And he's like, no. And so that puts doubt in the stranger's head, which gives the, the, you know, the heroes and villains who are on this uh, mission together, it gives them the upper hand slightly. But then once uh, the stranger fights back, you know, he's like, no, fine. You know what? I'll, I'll, I'm done. I'll go away. Like whatever Watcher's here for, like it spooks, it spooks me. It freaks me out. I don't want to be a part of this anymore. You know what? I'll, you're right. There's some other way we can, you know, either basically he's like, I, either there's another way I'll come up with to destroy you sometime in the future, or I'm just going to just let you all destroy everything. And who cares? Like, I, you know what? I don't want to be a part of this anymore. And he goes, but this, you know, this is not the way this was supposed to go. And I hate, um, I hate you humans. I just hate all of you. And so he, the stranger leaves. And, uh, and then he's like, but once I leave this planet, I'm holding it together. It's going to destroy itself. So uh, because of that, you know, stranger leaves, Watu's watching. And the whole team gets back on the ship. At this point, they have Venom back on their team because he was helping them fight uh, the stranger. He got in a few good licks too, which is pretty good. Stung the stranger a couple times in the neck with his scorpion tail and stuff and scratched him up a little bit. Uh, but they all get put on the ship and Gravity goes and grabs Venom, who is about to fall to his death. And he grabs Venom, grabs the heroes, uses gravity powers, puts them back on the ship that they came here on, the teleporting machine ship, puts them back on that, and then projects them out into space and then holds the planet together with its powers long enough for them to escape before the planet blows up. The planet blows up, and you think gravity dies with it, but luckily he ended up uh, getting back to the ship uh, in, in, uh, safely. So he does get back to the ship, um, and uh, and he's with the team, and they're like, oh, thank goodness, you know, he's alive. You know, he shows up there. Venom and the Hood and all these characters who are bad guys were like, kind of stunned by his sacrifice and the fact that they were all facing death, they were about to die, and Gravity, this new kid on the block, who's like two years old in the comics, uh, just saved them all. So uh, so yeah, it changes their perspective. So when they get back to Earth, you know, they all were like, all right, is everyone here? You know, Michael is, you know, Deathlock. He's like, is everyone here? And they go and do a roster call and they look over at Firebird and she's uh, holding Gravity and Gravity is dead. Uh, 100% dead. Um, well. Not really. It's comics. So the last few pages is really nice because it's, um, you know, this funeral. So I know I've been talking along. It's a longer episode, but there's a point to this. I wanted to kind of go through all this stuff, talk about gravity, talk about the, the stakes and all that stuff that are in the storyline, because there's a real arc here for Matt Gargan. It's a small arc, and it's not one that really brought a bunch of, you know, a change in the character, really, because they don't really, no other writers really reference this story after this, uh, I don't think. Um, which is a shame because this is part of Max's continuity. I thought this was a neat moment. Uh, they're all at the funeral, and actually the hood is there, and the hood even went to Gravity and said, hey, um, here's your you dropped your wallet back there. I saw a picture of your girlfriend in there, and he's like, I have a girlfriend too. Um, and he goes, and I think they both are white guys who date uh, black girls. So he was like, you know, it looks like we, you know, we, we, you know, we seem to be cut cut from a similar cloth, only you're a hero and I'm not a hero. And he goes, my girlfriend's about to have a baby. How about yours? And he goes, no, my girlfriend, it we used to be my best friend. And now we've just elevated our, our friendship to a relationship. And he goes, and I'll do anything to get back to her. And the hood said, yeah, I will too. He goes, but gravity, will you kill to go back to her? Because I will kill any one of you to get back to my girlfriend and our, our future child. And gravity's like, well, let's hope we don't have to make decisions like that. So at the end here, the hood actually goes up to Gravity's girlfriend at the funeral and says, hey, your boyfriend was a great guy. And he actually showed me something about sacrifice. And I was like, wow, that's pretty neat. Like this, this kid, kind of like a Spider-Man, had this impact on all these characters who, uh, some of them who've been in the Marvel Universe for a long time, and some like the Hood who were kind of just been revamped and stuff by Bendis and a couple other writers. So yeah, I kind of dug this. And then at the very end here, you know, um, you have, well, obviously Hank is with Firebird and stuff, and they're talking to Michael. But um, Craven goes over into the woods and he sees a guy standing there and he says, hey, I know it's you, Venom. And he's like, yeah. And he goes, you're a real piece of garbage. You know that, Gargan? And he goes, yeah, but a, a piece of garbage can still mourn the death of somebody who saved his life. So I really like that, actually. Like, Gargan is a piece of crap. I, actually, he's a pretty irredeemable character a lot of times. I don't see a lot of moments in his history where he's had a moment like this where there was, like, you know, some real emotion to him. He just seems like the bad guy a lot of times. 
And I thought this moment was awesome. Um, I think the cartoon did a pretty good job in the 90s animated show about adding a little humanity to him before he started to mutate, like he was more a victim as he transformed. But in the comics, he was kind of more like, yeah, I'm the scorpion and I'm a bad guy. But this was a neat moment. Uh, so that's why I wanted to kind of, you know, drag this out, talk a little bit about, talk about the story beats and stuff, because I feel like it helps deliver that moment at the end with Mac a lot better, you know, seeing that he went through this ringer. He was the bad guy at the beginning. He was the one person, even among some of the other bad guys and anti-heroes on the team, Mac really did not play along with the others and he even tried to kill them a few times. And yet that kid still saved his life. And that meant something to Mac. So he got away from Thunderbolts Mountain for a day or so and came over and got to go to the funeral. So yeah, pretty neat. Um, I thought that was awesome. So the book ends with Watu and he, it reveals, I wasn't there to watch the stranger lose. I was there to watch gravity die and make the sacrifice because turns out that's going to have a ripple effect it's to some degree it, it's a monumental moment no matter how big or small and it's a small one because it's it's one life basically but this one life is going to matter so um gravity they say is he's not gone for good and that his death is only the beginning of his true story and that's true i think he does come back in the comics like a year or two after this book came out maybe like two years so um, yeah, beyond, you know what? I gotta say, rereading it, I thought it was pretty good. I, I don't remember it being as good as it was when I read it. I'm not saying it's fantastic, it's not great, um, but I gotta say those character moments that Dwayne puts in it, all of his writing, when he put it in here, it really worked. And I like that he did something interesting with Matt Gargan. Like Matt Gargan, like I said, he's one of those characters where like, in the Thunderbolts book, it was there was some things that were kind of interesting, kind of where it's like, all right, he's. He's like in an abusive relationship with the symbiote and the symbiote makes him eat people and he doesn't want to and he's like throwing up human parts at the end of the night or whatever, you know, in his jail cell or something. I'm like, that's interesting, but you can't really, they didn't really delve into that or the psychology of it too much. They, you know, they, they just kind of, they hinted at it and, you know, tiptoed around it, but they didn't really do anything real interesting with it. This, I was like, well, this is pretty cliche to do with like a villain or anti-hero, but it still was like, it's something, you know, it's like, all right, it's, it's, you did something with Matt Gargan. And at the end, there was a little bit of humanity that sprung up inside of him. And that's, that's what you want. Even in your villains, sometimes you got to have those moments. So Dwayne McDuffie, you know, rest in peace, man, really great a writer. I've been a fan of yours for so long and it was such an honor to meet you and to go back and re-explore this book before we get back in the Flash Thompson stuff. I'm so glad. I, you know, I, I was bummed that I forgot about this. And it was funny, the day I remembered it, I actually was like, oh, wow, I own the hardcover. I was like going through comics because I was going to um, sell some. Uh, this was before I even decided to move from California. So this was like sometime like before Christmas um, and uh, of last year of 2019. And I was going through graphic novels and I was like, oh, let's see if I can sell some of these or trade them to the comic stores. And I found that one. I go, whoa, I completely forgot about this. this is a Matt Gargan book. And so I put it aside. And then I think like a month or two after, like Eddie's Mullet or someone commented and said, hey, are you going to review, you know, Beyond uh, that miniseries? And I was like, you know what? I just found that like, you know, a couple weeks ago or a month ago or whatever. And I'm like, so yes, I will. So I know it's taken like seven months or whatever, uh, but I finally got to it. So uh, I'm glad we got to talk about it today. Thought it was a fun book. If you can find it, I think maybe you can find the trade. I don't know. I feel like this is out of print now. I, the hardcover, I, I don't know. Um, so, you know, maybe on eBay or something like that. Maybe the single issues in the dollar bin, you can definitely find those. Um, and maybe on Comixology. I haven't personally looked it up on Comixology, but hopefully it's on there too. It's just called Beyond with a you know exclamation point at the end. Um, and it's by Dwayne McDuffie and Scott Collins. And Honestly, they made a good team. This was a fun book. So uh, if you've read it yourself, let me know what your thoughts are. If you agree with me, disagree with me, whatever it is, let me know in the comments down below and we'll continue our conversation down there. Now I definitely got to go. I got to go walk Echo real quick. And then I got about maybe 20 minutes to get ready for work and I got to head out to work. So you guys have a good weekend. Whenever this goes up, I'll try to get up as soon as I can. Uh, thank you guys so much. And then tomorrow, Sunday, I'll record the Venom, um, you know, the, the slime toy review. I have it behind me on my shelf back there. I know that's a Superman blanket on a Venom show, but that's okay because Superman fought Venom and Marvel vs. DC. Um, but yeah, so I have the toy back there on the second shelf. You can't really see it right now, but I'll do that review tomorrow, Sunday before work, and I'll try to get all this stuff up to you guys, you know, early next week, whatever I can for you. So thanks so much. See you in the future. Peace.